Welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart Podcast. My guest today is James O'Hara. He's an MP practicing with Kyle Gillette in Kansas City. So James, welcome to the show, brother. Yeah, Dr. Hart, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to get started today. Yeah, you guys, uh, you know, you and Kyle, you guys have an amazing podcast. You post so many things that are, you know, very, very interesting. I think that will resonate a lot with my audience today. So, you know, I have a ton of questions that I want to uh, ask you. Um, but one thing, you know, just to kind of get right into it, um, you did publish that TRT uh, study the other day with a really, really good breakdown. And I know that there's a lot of uh, your listeners and my listeners who are both interested in hormone optimization and in TRT or testosterone replacement therapy for people who don't know that's what we're talking about. Um, and there was a headline that came out that essentially said there was, you know, zero cardiovascular risk because that's anyway how the headline kind of was interpreted by most people um, when doing testosterone replacement therapy. And then you and you know, Kyle and the ways that you guys do always delve into the study and look into the nitty gritty details and you tease out, you know, what was actually said and if the headline actually matched the results. And from uh, what I see, you know, there were a couple of things that they omitted, you know, that uh, or that headline, I guess, wouldn't be completely accurate. So um, one of the big ones was pulmonary embolism, uh, I think was one. And then another one was the non-fatal uh, arrhythmias. So, um, you know, when you guys were looking at the study, looking at the headline, what was sort of your process? And were you very surprised at some of the results uh, that came out of it? Not necessarily the main, like the primary endpoint of major adverse cardiovascular events. So, when they're referring to no increased cardiac risk, you know, all the, the news outlets kind of took that and ran with it. They're talking about like atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So, so plaque buildup, people having heart attacks and strokes, uh, which was great news. And it, it kind of lined up with what we'd seen in some of the data using uh, angiography before. So for the audience, that's where you would inject some dye through an IV and then you can see Kind of changes in the blood vessels, how how narrowed or stenosed or, or how wide open and, and patent they are. So we knew kind of based on some of that prior data, um, smaller numbers, of course, but the prior data looked like, hey, you know, things look good here. It doesn't look like it's too concerning from a, a plaque buildup standpoint. Now, my caveat to that is if somebody goes on testosterone and their blood pressure goes through the roof and their, mm -hmm. you know, cholesterol goes through the roof, meaning like ApoB, uh, LDL, um, then that's probably going to accelerate atherosclerosis kind of, you know, if you're looking at an N of one, as opposed to this, this huge traverse study they did. Um, but when we talk about heart disease with patients, you know, this is part of the history taking, you know, people say, oh yeah, heart disease runs my family. And we have to kind of tease apart what that means. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, is that the electrical system of the heart? That's like the arrhythmia part you're talking about. You know, does somebody have AFib in the family history? Uh, and then you have structural. So like, you know, does somebody have congestive heart failure? Did they get an enlarged heart because of uncontrolled hypertension? And then you have the most common, when people talk, talk about cardiovascular disease, they're usually talking about the, the plaque buildup. Um, and that was a really reassuring outcome. Um, but then the secondary endpoints we looked at, the, the AFib seemed to be the big one that was about doubled, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, something around that. And then the increase in pulmonary embolism, um, saw an increase in, in DVT as well, which is not too, too surprising. Um, when you start testosterone, if you have that increase in hematocrit, it, kind of where they draw the line in the sand, there's there's different guidelines in the US and Europe and, and maybe even in Canada, but around 54% is where you can start to see a risk emerge for you know increased coagulation activation. So basically someone's risk for a DVT or a PE will start to go up. And a lot of people will have a, you know, a, a mutation in something like factor five, uh, which, which predisposes them to get a blood clot. Um, and they just don't know. I think it's about 10% of the population is a carrier for that. And it, it's not an issue if you're you know, 20, 30, probably even 40. But if you're a 65 year old guy, you go on TRT and you've already got this sort of unknown risk, then that can kind of tip the balance and and again, these are secondary outcomes. So it's something that we can still like take into account in the decision-making process. What are the risks, the benefits for this patient? Uh, but it's an area for future research. 
Okay, so when someone goes on TRT and say if they do have, and maybe, you know, they wouldn't be a good candidate if they did have certain, you know, uh, family history and, and certain uh, risk factors, but do you ever put someone on TRT and then suggest maybe to take 81 milligrams of aspirin a day to thin the blood? Like, do you think there's any, you know, role in that and maybe preventing um, any uh, cardiovascular events if someone is on TRT? And again, I mean, some people, this is a controversial area, but some people still believe, you know, you should be taking 81 milligrams of ASA, particularly if after you've had an MI, but, um, or a, a heart attack. So a myocardial mm -hmm. infarction, but, um, what is your approach? Like, do you guys ever put people on, um, blood thinners and by blood thinners, I'm really just talking about, you know, um, a baby aspirin or maybe if it is, is a full aspirin in certain cases. Yeah, occasionally, if you're trying to kind of, someone's on the line there where maybe they haven't hit that 54% number or or maybe they're in a situation where they, they you know can't phlebotomize and they're iron deficient. And this is before we, we switch them over to a different form of testosterone. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say they're on the injections, H&H, &H, you know, their red count is high. Um, they've got this you know, polycythemia or erythrocytosis, depending on how you define it. Um, you know, that's something you can do, I think, that is it's going to have a slightly positive effect. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like this person is now immune to getting, you know, blood clot, but it's going to have that, um, you know, effect where it probably has an effect to decrease the risk. Not a ton of data specifically in the TRT population. And again, like you said, it's controversial, even in things like primary prevention for like middle aged adults. There's probably a, a slight benefit there. If you're looking at older adults, it kind of looks like the risks start to outweigh the benefits um, on average where, you know, you're predisposing people to a GI bleed or older adults that are more likely to fall. Um, I always discuss with patients if we're starting them on an aspirin that, hey, you know, like they're like, oh, should I take that before I go fly? And that's a, that's a very common question because, you know, long international flights and so forth are risk factors for, you know, venous stasis and, and getting a DVT. Uh, the dehydration, the pressure changes, all these sort of things that happen. And, you know, the caveat is like, yeah, it's probably a good idea as long as you're not on your way to a ski trip where you could get a head injury or you're not on your way to go you know, play hockey or get in a boxing match or something like that. So when you're not like at a high risk of a head injury, that it's probably something that could be reasonable for people to do. I know many people do this, even though the data is mixed. And as long as you're not you know, someone that has a super high risk of ulcers, you know, like you've had bleeding stomach ulcers in the past or high risk of head injury, those sorts of things. I think there's a slight positive, but again, data is not super strong there, but you can kind of hedge on the side of caution with it. And did you mention hockey there just because I'm from Canada? Is that why I said hockey second in your, in your little? Yeah, theater? that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw that you uh, were or, or still are uh, a hockey player and yeah. it recreationally. Yeah, I did. I mean, I, I played a lot when I was, I was younger. I'm, I'm not so much into it now, more into the MMA, but I'm sure all the uh, Canadian listeners were surprised that you mentioned hockey second. So <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah. but just coming back to the uh, risk factors for a second. So someone's on TRT, like, there's always a reason why they would have a heart attack. So if you're able to manage the risk factors while they're on TRT, then, you know, in theory, you should be able to put someone at low risk if they, if you are able to manage the risk factors. Now, some people may not be able to. So what do I mean by that? Some people might go on testosterone replacement therapy. And like, you know, James said earlier, they're, their blood pressure might just go sky high and there's, you know, no real way to, you know, take that down. Whereas other, you know, obviously with medications and things like that, you can, but, you know, with, uh, other people, you know, can take, um, testosterone place of therapy and then they just won't see, you know, an increase in their high blood pressure. And the same thing too, with like hematocrit and with, um, uh, you know, uh, CBC hemoglobin, all these kinds of things. Like if you, some people for whatever reason will have this giant spike where some people won't. So I think like if you do go see a doctor, you just want to make sure that you're, you know, managing all of your risk factors. So again, you know, it wouldn't be any different for someone on TRT who's not on TRT when you're talking about managing risk factors for um, heart disease. And is that sort of how the approach you guys take with your patients? It's like, you know, we'll try this, we'll see what's going on, but we're going to really, really closely look at all of the factors that could potentially put you at risk for, you know, a heart attack or a stroke or some kind of cardiac event. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, just like you would look at someone trying to prevent heart disease in the first place, you're going to be managing the same risk factors when someone's on TRT. And and the vast majority of people are not going to develop a new onset blood pressure issue or a new onset cholesterol issue with their lipids. So it's something that you do watch for just because you want to be thorough and you don't want to have a a sort of, you know, silent risk factor there that you've created uh, because, you know, people don't feel their cholesterol rising. People don't really feel when they're like stage one hypertension, even though it's causing some damage in the background. So yeah, it's, it's just exactly like the average person who comes in and we're trying to really take a preventive approach and make sure that we're managing all these risk factors. Yeah. And that's, that's a good point, especially like the hypertension, because, you know, people will mention headaches and I always, you know, all doctors, I think ask their patients if they have a headache when they're when they have hypertension, but it's not everyone who gets a headache, you know, like some people, you know, their blood pressure is only like 140 and 150 and they get headaches, but then you have people who are like 170, 180 and they're like, I don't even, I don't even know, you know what I mean? So it's, uh, it definitely is is like you know the silent killer like as you know it has been dubbed for a long time and yeah for sure sometimes people get headaches and when you take their blood pressure down you know they have less headaches and that's amazing but you know it definitely is um the uh the silent killer there um in terms of patients on on trt um if you do see a rise in their LDL or their ApoB, at that point, do you stop or decrease the dose or do you more like, hey, maybe let's you know put you on a statin or put you on a, another drug to maybe manage this? What would be your approach there? Yeah. I mean, if, if you start someone and they're just at a replacement level, let's say their testosterone goes from you know 200 to 600, right? And, and there's more nuance to it with SHBG, and, and, but that would kind of be an average response, right? They're, they're not you know, topping out the range. It's not abnormally high. Uh, that person is less likely to see a elevation in things like LDL and ApoB. But if you get into the high end where someone, maybe this guy's a slow metabolizer, uh, his levels are at 1,200, free testosterone is also proportionally you know, you know, running too high for him where it's affecting things like blood pressure and, and uh, lipids then yeah, it can be a dose dependent thing. You say, okay, let's just tweak the dose. Let's back off a little bit here. Let's see what happens with that. Um, sometimes it is the case that the testosterone just speeds up the, you know, the same enzyme that statins work on, you know, the HMG CoA, and you're actually synthesizing the you know, cholesterol a little bit faster. You're creating more of these LDLs. Um, and I won't immediately go to a, a statin for most people. I, I try to use something a little more mild, you know, we'll, we'll try to really push fiber, We'll add in maybe some ezetimibe, uh, which just blocks a specific tra- uh, transporter in the intestine um, and, and doesn't seem to have that maybe you know few percent people where they get these kind of myopathies from it or have an elevation in liver enzymes. Yeah, and we're still following up on those things, but it's sort of like if we're taking a stepped approach, we, we kind of like to do the, you know, the, the least aggressive thing. And then if we need to, we can always go back and, and make adjustments. And so sometimes, James, you would use easy trawl um, ahead of a statin. Yeah. Yeah. Because you'll see a number of people that are actually hyper responders to the zetamide. Uh, depends on how much of their, you, know, you think of you know, cholesterol synthesis versus cholesterol absorption. And we all kind of agree at this point that dietary cholesterol, it, if it does anything, it's maybe one or two points on, on your LDL. It, it's really not worth chasing down. Uh, and like you know, sabotaging someone's diet quality in, in sake of getting to zero dietary cholesterol. Um, and, you know, there's saturated fat. But I, I have people pick the diet that they enjoy. They think they can stick to, uh, and it's healthy. You know, that that third one is the tricky part for people. Uh, but yeah, pushing fiber, and then if someone happens to be a kind of on that hyper absorber spectrum, then they may get more than that sort of you know ten to fifteen percent reduction. You know, I've I've seen people get you know over a fifty percent reduction from these wow. You can get these you can get these genetic tests and see if this person you know has this SNP that okay yeah this person is a hyper absorber, but you can also do the in vivo test just give the person the medication see what the response is. You know, it, here it's a, it's a fairly cheap generic drug. Um, so you can do that test. And then if they get a, an optimal response, then, you know, that's great. They've got like, that is actually the best treatment for that person if they have that, that gene. Um, and then if not, and if they're a non-responder to it, then definitely have to change the approach. 
And then coming back to fiber, it's specifically psyllium husk that you recommend to your patients when you're trying to lower their LDL overall. Is that correct? I think that has the most data. Um, I, I'm not necessarily a stickler. That's what I'm recommending most often uh, when it comes to a fiber supplement, just because it's it's easy to get. It's not very expensive. Uh, it's something that I just I throw in like some Greek yogurt and mix it up. You know, I get an extra 10 grams of fiber that way. Um, so it's generally psyllium husk, but, you know, things like berries in the diet, vegetables, you know, even whole grains if people do okay with those from a GI standpoint. Okay. And do you always take your fiber with, say, like your fattiest meal? Not necessarily. Um, in theory, if you're trying to block the absorption, you might have a little bit of an effect there. I, I know there's mixed data on things like plant sterols that people would take with meals. Um Basically, with the supplementation out there, it's not going to be quite as effective as, you know, using a, a pharmaceutical, very targeted approach. Um, but there are some people who do have a, a positive response and, and no side effects or their plant sterols. They're like, yep, yeah, I just do this. I take it with my biggest meal of the day or a high fat meal. Um, and if we're seeing good results, you know, on paper in the labs, then I'm not going to take that away from them and say, no, you need to take a prescription because, you know, if we're looking at the cholesterol and the lipids like and we believe that the LDL is driving that effect, uh, which for most people, you know, it's going to contribute to that plaque eventually. Um, then, yeah, I'm not going to you know, say, hey, no, you, you can't do your plant sterols. You can't do your fiber. You need to take this because we'd like to take kind of the best parts of lifestyle supplementation, best parts of medication, and then kind of blend all that together, take an integrated approach. And then you, you run into less side effects as, as opposed to just trying to hammer you know, pharmaceuticals. Um, regarding LDL and, and ApoB, um, like I know this is, you know, well, LDL has been the rage for decades, but ApoB, I think, you know, the last few years, especially with uh, Dr. Peter Tia's book, Longevity, um, you know, he's talked a lot about ApoB. I noticed one thing that he didn't mention in there. I mean, it's the book's so big, it's hard to, you know, put everything in there. It's certainly not a knock at him. But do you ever measure oxidized LDL instead of just uh, calculated LDL? And you think there's like occasionally there? Occasionally. Um, the perfect patient I would measure that in would be, let's say, someone who has their lipids under control, but we're still seeing like a picture that doesn't make sense, right? So someone, their, their LDL is 50, their ApoB is 60, um, you know, something like that, where they, these should be very low risk people, but we're seeing evidence of plaques. So the oxidized LDL, I mean, it, it does correlate with generally the level of cholesterol, but not always, not in every patient. So for people where, you know, they want a little closer look or um, they have this idea that, you know, well, if they have larger LDL particles, they're you know, not going to be atherogenic. They're not going to have a problem. And then sometimes we can look and say, okay, we'll do this, you know, in a more lipo profile and we can see the particle breakdown. Um, and then the mass me measurement, the LDLC and then the ApoB. Um, HDLs, you know, we don't really bank on those as being protective. They are in a subset of people, but um, outside of like some HDL function tests you can get that, you know, it, as a betting person, you probably wouldn't want to bet your life. Um, you know, people may go to the casino or whatever, but we don't really rely on the HDL as being as protective as maybe we thought, you know, 10 plus years ago. Um, what about but oxides LDL? Go ahead. So I was going to say, what about the HDL to triglyceride ratio? Like a lot of people are looking at this now and I have seen some studies that have shown that there is, you know, quite a bit of correlation. I mean, not, you know, to the extent that say like ApoB is, has, you know, been, um, you know, teased out in the literature, but what about HDL to triglyceride ratio? Like how valuable do you think that, uh, that number is? Yeah, I think it's a good proxy for how metabolically healthy someone is, you know, how active they are. Um, and we know that, you know, that the LDL matters and the LDL matters maybe a little bit less if someone is extremely healthy and extremely fit. Uh, I wouldn't say it's to matter zero, but yeah, if someone has a, a nice high HDL, they're probably getting a lot of exercise in, they're probably not sedentary, they're probably not hammering the processed foods, um, and that you know, your triglycerides are going to be low because also the exercise and they're not hammering sugar. Uh, I mean, someone can literally go into a lab, um, they have high triglycerides, you know, send them, have them walk on a treadmill for 30 minutes or jog, go check the triglycerides again, and it will drop that quickly. Uh, from exercise. So it, it just goes to speak to the lifestyle. 
Um, and then, like I said, there are certain, you know, seemingly hyper functioning HDLs where this is probably the, there's kind of a mystery protective factor. Um, there was the, the Scott Hart trial looking at CCTA imaging compared to standard of care, which, which usually involves stress testing, basically trying to tease out people who are, are high risk that need intensive therapy. Um, and even in these patients who are you know, quite similar to the Traverse trial where they're, you know, diabetic, high blood pressure, you know, they have all these numerous health issues, obesity, um, and, you know, around 5% of those people have clean coronary arteries that, you know, we just can't quite explain. So not every person with the risk factors is going to develop it. But if you're the, the 95% of the population, which most of us are going to be, um, then you definitely want to be controlling those things. Yeah. I mean, I think there was a study that came out maybe two or three weeks ago. I think a lot of people said like, oh, this proves that, you know, um, LDL doesn't have any role in, in heart disease. And I think, you know, when you look at that particular trial, it was like, okay, in very, very healthy people who have, you know, who are exercising, who have absolutely no other risk factors, meaning like, you know, they don't have high blood pressure. Um, they're not overweight. They don't have, have a sedentary lifestyle. They have a healthy diet, like all these kind of things. And then they have LDL, it, a high LDL. It doesn't seem like they develop that much atherosclerotic plaque. And that may be true, but it's true not just because they have, you know, um, high LDL and not saying that that's, you know, the reason why that that's happening. The reason why it's happening is because they have all their other, you know, risk factors controlled. And so, you know, if there's 10, let's just say, I mean, there's obviously many risk factors. Let's just say there's 10 risk factors for heart disease. Yeah. If you have eight or nine of them or nine out of 10 of them controlled and one of them's, you know, not so well controlled, you're probably still going to be fairly low risk overall. But it doesn't mean that, you know, if someone is lowering their LDL, that it still won't, um, you know, contribute less to heart disease overall. And I think, you know, Lane Norton's kind of, you know, been real strong on this with regards to even if you look at the Mendelian randomization trials, it seems like the more you lower LDL, you know, the less likely it is for heart disease. But that being said, again, it's just one risk factor. Yes, if you control all of your other risk factors and your LDL is, you know, moderately high, then you're probably not overall at risk for, you know, heart disease compared to the average person who may have five or six risk factors, but they have their LDL controlled. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I know the um, sort of the, the paper you're referencing and the uh, the presentation they did. And um, the the takeaway is not that these people have zero plaque, but that the LDL was not correlated with the plaque volume. So um, we actually went in and looked at this in, in the slides and there are people enrolled in that. It's just a one year trial with before and after imaging. Um, I think the LDL was over 200 on average. Um, and some of those people do have plaque volume. So it, my sort of suspicion is if you see these people that are extremely healthy, and I believe they're all in active ketosis, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but when you see these people that are extremely healthy and they have no baseline plaque, um, I would hypothesize those people will probably go this you know one year and, and not develop plaque there that you can actually see on the CCTA. The people who already have some plaque there, you know, we know they don't have that mystery protective factor probably. So I think those would be the ones that we'd see plaque accumulation in. And, and to your point, this is probably, you know, less than 1% of the population that has this, you know, if you take BMI, yeah. um, body fat percentage, triglycerides being below, I think 80, um, HDL being above 60, you know, all these factors, like very few people will fit that mold. Um, and that's really my my fear with it is if the you know the the, the media takes the the headline LDL not correlated with heart disease that that will undo some of the the work we've done in, in getting that as a risk factor in in people's minds and and again it's not that we can't push back against it um, but it'll just make our jobs a little bit more difficult. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. So really appreciate you and Kyle kind of breaking that down. It's a great slide. You should go on uh, James's Instagram and, and look at it. Um, one question, and I mentioned this before the uh, the podcast. So you guys had a very uh, 
really funny um, clip that came out where you uh, it was you were asking you were talking about Viagra and Cialis, but not in terms of like um, from men. So the study was asking their partners and which was I didn't even know that study existed. So I guess uh, 80 percent of females would prefer their male counterparts to use Cialis instead of Viagra. And then there was 5% that uh, wanted them to use nothing. So I was wondering if you were kind of <laughs> surprised about the findings of that study. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that that kind of lines up with what we know. You know, most people are using Tadalafil now, just uh, generic Cialis, because it has the long half-life. Um, it's not like an on-demand thing. I, I think it takes the pressure off of both individuals. So it kind of lines up with what we kind of see in, in prescribing patterns. Um, and then that, yeah, the 5%, I, again, I, I don't know exactly if that's, they had no preference at all or they preferred they not use it. Uh, but it's kind of funny to look, to look at the numbers like that. It's like, well, you, know, it, you can take it as 5% of women want their partner to be impotent, yeah. <laughs> uh, which may very well be the case, but it may just be that like, they don't really care. <laughs> and coming back to the uh, talodafinil for a sec. So, um, you know, it has other uses, though, besides uh, erectile dysfunction. And the biggest one that I've seen, I think Kyle's talked about this a little bit, too, is that it's it can be effective for BPH or an enlarged prostate. Um, and I think Kyle said that, you know, if you're using, you know, five milligrams, I think he said not to go over 10 milligrams a day. And I think for right now, the it's only five that's approved for daily use. But you can see reduction in nighttime urination, like like roughly by like 50%. And I've seen it now in combination drugs. So just like there's, you know, diabetes combination drugs, there's also BPH combination drugs. Um, I forget which one they did combine it with maybe one of the, um, the kind of aflazosin maybe or something yeah, like that. Yeah, something like that. So, I mean, it's definitely, you know, legitimate out there now. But have you uh, noticed some of your patients have said, you know, it's really helped with nighttime urination or nocturia in general? Yeah, yeah. And I think this may just be a fact of having patients that haven't yet developed like clinical, you know, BPH where it's obvious and they're having, you know, dribbling and things like that during the day. But, you know, maybe maybe the first sign there, the, the canary in the coal mine is that like, yeah, I used to sleep through the night and now I'm getting up once or twice. It, it seems like in our patient population, the like the real world use of the Tadalafil is outperforming that 50% number. Because again, in those trials, that's going to be, you know, older guys that have, have probably had BPH right. for some time, probably other comorbidities. So yeah, I mean, if I have a, you know, 35, 40 year old guy and you know, they get up once or twice a night, sometimes it's been able to completely knock that out. You know, dosage wise, somewhere between 2.5 and 5. Um, it, and it's really interesting that they, they don't know the exact mechanism there, just like a lot of medications. It's like exact yeah. mechanism unknown, but you know, it, it has this effect. So probably has to do with, you know, the vasodilation. That's the main mechanism overall, uh, maybe relieving some prostate congestion, you know, getting more blood flow in there to the tissue. Uh, but again, you know, it, it does seem to be doing quite well in practice. Okay. I'm really appreciate you saying that because that is a big issue for a lot of guys, like almost like all my patients, even my friends too, like they all say like, you know, they, they get up during the night. So, you know, there are solutions out there. So I'm really happy that you, that you mentioned that. Um, I want to change things up a little bit just cause I didn't think we're going to spend this much time on testosterone, but I really happy that you answered all those questions. Um, SSRIs and PMMD. So a lot, I know you did a post on this, uh, recently and you know, there are a lot of people on SSRIs and, you know, for some people, you know, they can be a life-saving medication for some people that can ruin their lives. I say that to you know, every people, the same thing about, you know, cannabis. I, I believe it when you tell me that it made you go completely psycho. And I believe it when you made, when you say that, you know, it's the only thing that helps you sleep at night. It just, you know, it depends on, on the, on the particular patient. Um, but looking at SSRIs, like, uh, you know, before you initiate someone on an SSRI, like what are the biggest things that they, you know, should be worried about? Cause some people are, worried about, you know, post-sexual dysfunction being permanent. Um, and so what's your sort of approach there and what should people be worried about in terms of long-term use? Yeah, I, I think definitely making sure that there's not um, an impairment in sexual function at baseline. 
uh, again, if someone's depressed, you know, their, their libido is probably going to take a hit just because of the depression and you know, they're, they're not feeling good. Everything takes more energy, feels like it takes more effort than it should. So a lot of times, you know, you see a decrease in sexual activity, decrease in libido, uh, but, you know, actual work and function itself. Right. So, you know, it, does this woman have any issue with, you know, blood flow or lubrication? Does this man have any issue with erectile function? Um, because, you know, if they have underlying dysfunction at baseline and then you put them on the SSRI, they'll kind of put two and two together and say, well, the SSRI caused this when in reality, you know, there was an underlying issue there. Um, and there's also that correlation with metabolic health and depression. So if someone is not particularly healthy and then they go on an SSRI, some of those health problems that they develop or were going to develop um, may be attributed to the SSRI. So I, my sort of philosophy is, you know, the lowest effective dose um, and then for the the shortest period of time. So with the PMDD specifically, you know, th these women, you know, they may have a you know, up to 50 percent of the month where they're having, you know, symptoms that are interfering with their life. They may feel, you know, irritable. They may feel very profoundly depressed. Um, and then there comes along, you know, bloating and craving and, and these all, all these sorts of things. Um, and, and sometimes you can do something as low as you know five milligrams of fluoxetine every other day because it has such a long half life. It's like um, three so days, you, isn't it, or something crazy? I think. Yeah, I, I think around forty eight hours, maybe forty eight to seventy two, something like that. Yeah. So it's one of the easier ones to get off of if you're talking about just antidepressants generally, because yeah. it has that longer half life, and it also happens to be a little bit um, weight negative. So you, you tend to see like some like. Uh, not an SSRI, but like mirtazapine, people will tend to gain weight on that. Yeah. Uh, whereas with the fluoxetine, it's not huge. You maybe you see a few pounds that people tend to lose. Yeah. Um, so, so that can be an advantage. No, that's that's a good point because a lot of people think that you know SSRIs uh, put weight on, and I have seen meta analysis indicating that there's not much of a change overall when when putting people on SSRIs and weight. But you're right, though. It is different for other medications. Mirtazapine is probably one of the worst ones for it. Um, Seroquel, which of a lot of people here use in Canada as for, for sleep, um, it's kind of become one of the more popular medications. I've seen a lot of patients been using it for sleep recently. And in lower doses, I think it's not too bad for weight gain, but higher doses – you know, big time, it, it does cause weight gain. So, um, yeah, I just want to make that point that it's, you know, SSRIs certainly not saying that they're side effect free by any means whatsoever, but, um, in terms of weight gain, they seem to be less in, t in, you know, compared to other psych drugs, such as antipsychotics like Seroquel or also known as uh, quetiapine. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think your, your approach is right. Like, is there an underlying cause before you start an SSRI? SRI is a very, very important thing to look at. Um, you know, like we talked about, the underlying cause could be testosterone in some cases, low testosterone, but there could be other cases as well. And then, like you said, too, just depression in itself, like one of the manifestations of depression is low libido. You know, like when you're depressed, you don't really feel like having sex. So there's a lot going on there. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't think we should completely eliminate SSRIs, but I think you should pay very, very close attention to the sexual function because that's not something that you want to you know permanently uh affect so i do think this should be monitored closely for sure um also uh you know switching gears a little bit towards towards females um in terms of the birth control pill is that something that um you know, when someone asks you to go on the pill, is that something that you have a, is there a specific discussion that you have with someone before they go on the pill or is there, um, you know, certain risk factors that you take into place? I mean, outside of the, you know, the obvious risk factors of, you know, smoking and pulmonary embolism and that kind of thing. But a lot of people now are really worried about birth control, just affecting their, um, their fertility, affecting their mood um, and that kind of thing. But also, so too, you know, it's a pretty good thing that you're not getting pregnant, you know. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot to, to take in there. So, what is your general approach when someone you know asks to go on birth control? Yeah, it, it, like you said, the birth control pill is a wonderful thing. Being able to choose when you do and, and do not reproduce and, and have a child is super important. Um, 
as far as the risk factors, like you said, you know, people who are smoking, um, even, you know, with obesity, um, you know, migraine with aura, these things are, you know, we know those are people who you should really be using a, a different form of contraception because the, the risks of things like DBT, um, as far as like, you know, which birth control pill to use, cause there's, you know, dozens of sort of you know, flavors out there, different combinations. Uh, it, it kind of depends on the individual's goals. If you're looking at, you know, a woman who is perhaps, you know, an, an athlete and you don't want to, um, just crush free testosterone. I mean, if you put them on, we have a brand name pill here in the U S called the Yaz, um, yes. that has Drosperinone and then also has ethanol estradiol. Like their free testosterone is going to drop 80 plus percent because their SHBG is going to go very, very high, uh, because Drosperinone itself is anti-androgenic. And then we know ethanol estradiol estrogens orally in general are going to increase the SHBG. So even if their total testosterone is high normal for a female, they're going to have most of that bound up by the, the sex of binding globulin. So as far as like uh, the long-term fertility concerns of coming off of the birth control, if you're using it just to cover up symptoms, which is something that you read a lot about and hear a lot about with, you know, a, you know, a 16 year old, they start getting some acne or they have painful periods or, you know, their mom had PCOS, older sister had PCOS and they just go on a birth control pill. Well, it's probably that underlying PCOS that is driving fertility difficulties after coming off. You know, just like, like I said, before we start someone on SSRI, we want to really look at kind of what's going on with their health picture before rather than just, you know, going to the pill and then kind of blaming the pill afterwards. Some people will get you know, very depressed going on a birth control pill. Uh, some people, they don't even realize they're taking it. Um, so, again, there's things you can do to kind of push back against that. Uh, even tiny, tiny doses of uh, vitamin B6 will kind of help to you know, modulate that, that serotonin synthesis that kind of get dis gets disrupted uh, by most oral contraceptives. Um, and then, you know, things like you know, omega-3s are reasonable. You'll see platelet count go up. Um, you'll see SHBG go up. So sometimes you know, adding in some supplemental boron or even some DHEA to kind of push back against that. Um, again, I think here in the U S DHEA is over the counter, but I, I think it's a prescription over there in, uh, in Canada. It is, but you, you said a lot there and there's a lot to, uh, unpack. So Yaz is definitely prescribed in Canada, uh, as well. It's definitely one of the more popular birth controls, uh, um, pills here and, you know, talking about free testosterone, SHBG. So, um, you know, everyone doesn't know, uh, you know, exactly what those terms are. So what James is saying is that, you know, when women take Yaz as a birth control, it can drop their free testosterone because it increases their SHBG, which means that a lot of their testosterone is going to be bound. So when it's bound, it's not going to be able to be active in the cells. It's not going to do the things that you want to do. So meaning that your testosterone is not going to be active. You're not going to feel good. You're not going to have the energy, the sex drive, all the things that come along with high testosterone. And 80% is, I mean, that is a crazy amount of, of testosterone to lose. Um, and then, you know, coming back again to, uh, the boron, I've actually been thinking about doing a post on, on boron lately. So not only, uh, can boron, uh, decrease your SHBG, which will free up your free testosterone. And this works both, um, in males and females, although I'm, I'm only sure of, me, I've only seen one human study on this, but maybe there's there's more. But it definitely was a human study that showed that boron did increase free testosterone. But the other day, I was noticing that uh, on examine.com, I'm sure you use that all the time as well, James. Um, mm -hmm. They had uh, boron as the number one thing to lower CRP. So C-reactive protein is uh, something that we uh, test for inflammation overall. Um, it's one of the more common tests that we use here in Canada anyway. And they noted in on exam that boron, they gave that uh, grade A evidence for lowering CRP, C-reactive protein. So kind of getting, you know, two birds with one stone. So with boron, you know, not only can you lower your SHBG and potentially increase your free testosterone, you may actually be able to lower your CRP, which I've seen also as a risk factor for heart disease, but we won't get 
back into that. I don't want to sidetrack too, too much. Um, <laughs> but yeah, a lot to unpack there. You said a lot about, uh, a lot of good things about birth control with regards to, you know, yaz and, and decrease in the free testosterone. Cause I can see how, you know, someone would become depressed because you've posted about this before, James, like, um, women have more testosterone in their body than they actually do estrogen, which is crazy. And so, um, to think I didn't even know that before, I think it was you posted it first or someone did maybe a year ago, something like that. And so, you know, it's important to, for females to know that testosterone is a very important hormone for them, just like it is for males. And if that is decreased, then you are going to have the same effects that, you know, uh, a low T, um, male patient would have. So, you know, you may have low sex drive. You may feel a little bit more depressed, um, that kind of thing. Um, just switching gears a little tiny bit. So on days 16 to 28, so sometimes if someone is really, really, you know, struggling with, you know, really painful cramps, really painful periods, I actually put them on a low dose of uh, progesterone, but it's just for, you know, the last days of their cycle. And for, um, you know, some women, it makes a huge difference. Um, do you guys ever experience with that or use that as a treatment modality for your patients who are really struggling with, with painful cramping, painful periods? Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it makes sense. Sometimes these women have, uh, you know, an, an estrogen dominance picture, which you know, is kind of hard to define, but the, the phenotype you kind of see is, you know, they're, they have obesity, they probably have increased aromatase activity, uh, you know, converting, you know, uh, testosterone into estrogen. Cause like you just said, you know, there's more testosterone, you know, milligram per milligram than there is estrogen in the body, uh, of females of, of basically every person walking around. Right. Um, and, and we know that women with obesity have a higher risk of you know, uterine cancer, uh, probably because they have more of this sort of unopposed estrogen. And, and all you're doing there is just adding back some of that progesterone to help oppose the buildup of that lining. And a lot of times you'll see, yeah, you know, they, they have reduced symptoms. They don't feel like they're getting, you know, as bloated at lower doses, you know, higher doses of progesterone can kind of paradoxically cause some fluid retention. But yeah, you, you oppose the buildup. Um, they have lighter periods, less cramping. Uh, they, they tend to sleep better, which a lot of times sleep is an issue in the luteal phase. So it can be a really good thing that um, for most women has a, a really good risk benefit profile. It, you have a number of women that will just respond poorly to progesterone where it, it just makes them either way too drowsy. That's why we give it before bed usually. Yeah. Um, or even causes some depressive symptoms, just depending on how sensitive their their GABA receptors are. But again, that's a very small subset. And and again, so with the uh, progesterone, if you give too much, you can potentially lower DHT. And you know, lowering DHT has you know, benefits in some ways, but if you lower DHT too much, like everyone's always like lower DHT, lower DHT, particularly guys for, you know, male pattern baldness and that, but DHT is also really, really important for your overall well being and your health. So like you definitely don't want to lower it too, too much. You know, like I've heard Huberman say before, and you know, I'll say it too, even with someone with a full head of hair, like, you know, I'd rather probably be bald and have normal levels of DHT than, you know, have, uh, than have hair and have, uh, you know, low levels of, of DHT just because the hormone is so important for your overall well-being and, and your mood. So, um, you know, when someone has, uh, you know, low DHT, especially if they're, uh, or it doesn't matter actually if they're female or male, that can particularly be a problem if their, you know, well-being kind of drops. Yeah, I, I think it, it varies from person to person. You know, some people, they, they will notice even a, like a minute change in their DHT. You know, I, I think Andrew Huberman referenced, you know, maybe taking a, a, a turmeric supplement or yeah. something like that. And then, you know, just feeling off and then and seeing in his own blood work that, you know, this dropped my DHT. So it, that can be helpful if you have a baseline measurement. And, and then again, it depends on kind of how sensitive someone is to that, um, how sensitive they are to androgens in general. So I, I think there are people out there who absolutely, you know, they feel better with more DHT in their system. And then I think there's people out there who is as long as they have sufficient testosterone. So again, going back to the, just like we talked about with the SSRI, if you're going to start someone on you know, a medication for hair loss, you want to make sure that they have a very good hormonal status at baseline. 
um, and that they're not having any you know symptoms that could be exacerbated. You know, you don't want to start someone on finasteride or dutasteride that's already struggling with erectile function. That's mm-hmm. probably going to make things worse for that person. They're actually relying on that DHT because they may have lower testosterone as a whole. So we, we kind of think about net androgens. Okay, net androgens. That's um, that's that's actually really important. I like how you said that. But um, you already said my next question, so I wanted to ask you about to test drive finasteride. So you know, guys are so this is also called uh, Propecia. So um, you know, guys are always asking about this medicine. You know, I have friends ask about it. You know, they want to prevent hair loss, and you know, they think there's like no side effects to it. They think like like we just talked about before, they don't really understand the importance of, of DHT, but with finasteride, is it something that you guys avoid completely? Is it something that you just closely monitor or what is your, your approach when someone comes in and they, you know, say that they want to you know, start finasteride because of male pattern baldness? Yeah. So if finasteride, I'm not really starting anyone on uh, dutasteride is a little bit different. That's usually what I'm going to, go to first, which, which sounds kind of counterintuitive because it has a longer half-life, um, but we're starting very infrequently. So, like, you know, I, I may have someone taking it once every two weeks. Okay. Um, I may have someone take it every 10 days and then every week, just kind of slowly, you know, instead of going from, let's say your DHT is 70 to your DHT is five, you know, we're kind of slowly inching it down and seeing how they tolerate that. Um, you know, they're, I had someone ask a question the other day about, should I do a loading dose? And I would recommend not doing that Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, you're basically trying to see, you know, is this causing any negatives? You know, it is going to change the balance of estrogens to androgens in all sorts of tissue. Um, So that's why you can see, you know, nipple sensitivity, gynecomastia in in people who are predisposed to that at baseline. So, you know, if a a guy had gynecomastia when they through puberty, very common, I think about 50% of People will have that just because you've got a ton of growth hormone, a ton of sex hormone fluctuations, kind of the perfect storm there. Um, then, you know, they're more likely to get that. It doesn't mean it's always going to happen. Um, and then there's topical versions. Some people are like, you know, hey, I, I never want to, you know, take that and, and reduce my DHT level super, super significantly. The topicals, like finasteride definitely goes systemic and you can get a 70% reduction. I haven't seen anyone oh, sure. bottom out their DHT with yeah. um, like a topical dutasteride, but the finasteride, it's, it's kind of, you know, with all these health startups that have popped up and, you know, topical finasteride is, you know, no side effects. So you can lower your DHT by about 70% with, with finasteride? Yeah, just like the, the oral. So it depends That's on the not. concentration. Uh, but if you have a high enough dose of topical you're applying, then it, it's basically going to be exactly the same as someone taking a finasteride pill. The caveat that you're missing out on probably some of the metabolites, you, you don't have that first pass effect using it topically, of course. Yeah. I mean, I still really like the term you, you used earlier, like net androgens, you know, looking at everything completely, all of the, the hormones. But, um, you know, a 70 percent drop in um, in DHT, like, you know, it's almost impossible for that to not affect the net androgens overall like it's you know if you had maybe like a 10 or 20 percent drop in 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 dht but you know your uh your 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 free t was still high and all that you know maybe you wouldn't notice so much but a 70 percent drop seems like um you know if that is the case for an individual it seems like that's gonna affect your net androgens and it's probably going to you know, affect you. Um, the only, you know, thing about that too, that I, I work, I sometimes, you know, was kind of, uh, creeping into my mind then was, you know, if you do it slowly, um, and I do think that is the best way to do it, then sometimes people can like slowly, um, not really notice how they're feeling because their, you know, their, their self-awareness just kind of, you know, decreases by so much that eventually over time and they get to a point and it's like, how did I get here? And it's like, you got here because, you know, you just took a little bit of this over time and affects you a little bit and a little bit. And that's where I think blood work comes into play and why you should, you know, go see a doctor because if you, you know, take a little bit of it and then, you know, uh, eventually you, you notice that you're not feeling well and then you do the test and then all of a sudden your DHT is bottomed out. Well, then I think there you have 
you know, the reason. But if you don't do that particular test and you just kind of do it every day, then it also you may just end up one day thinking like, you know, how did I get here kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Those, those changes can happen slowly. It's just like how someone's, you know, holiday weight gain kind of gets away from them. Six months later, they're like, well, I'm, I'm 20 pounds heavier. What happened? And it was kind of that slow change. You know, they see themselves in the mirror every day and, you know, they just, you know, they don't notice it day to day. And then six months later, it's like, wow. Um, so, yeah, it, it could be a concern. Um, you know, it's something that you definitely want to follow up on. Uh, I think now more than ever, people are willing to be kind of forthcoming if they are having any you know, sexual issues. So now I think the dialogue is very much open, whereas, you know, before maybe we didn't know as much about the side effects, you know, things like potentially depression. Uh, there was a warning label added to the finasteride for that, um, because, again, you know, if, if you decrease net androgens enough, then you'll absolutely have side effects. And you could probably put a you know, if you're, if you're trying to calculate a net androgen and create a formula. Um, maybe your testosterone, each nanogram per deciliter, that's worth one point. Uh, maybe the, the DHT has a five or a seven X multiplier on it. Um, cause yeah, if you lower the DHT 70%, you'll see testosterone rise. Uh, cause you know, for one, you're not converting that in your body also, you know, is sort of trying to get back to homeostasis. It's saying, Hey, you know, there's, there's less net energies around, let's produce more testosterone. So it's not a huge increase, but, you know, I've seen, you know, 10% in total testosterone go up. That's not unreasonable or unheard of. Okay. Yeah, that would, that would uh, make sense for sure. And I know we only have uh, a few minutes left, but if someone, you know, um, is losing their hair and they don't want to take, you know, finasteride or dutesteride, what are the best options out there? Yeah, it, there's a lot of things that can be done there. Um, a, a topical dutasteride, due to its larger molecular size, um, I won't say it goes systemic zero, but it goes systemic much, much less. So you can it's still, in theory, get that localized effect. It's probably not going to be as effective as an oral dutasteride where you're, you're oral finasteride where you're lowering things as much. Uh, but it can still be useful as kind of a preventive um, minoxidil, even if you're just using the topical like Rogaine over the counter. I mean, if someone starts using that today, like within three, four months, they're going to see results if, as long as they're a responder to that. Um, and then, you, you know, the, on average, five years after starting, you're still going to have more hair than you started with. So if someone's plan is to, you know, never address things hormonally, just use the Rogaine, you put the Minoxidil, and then in, in five years, they plan to get a transplant or something like that, that can be a perfectly reasonable strategy. And then there's other, you know, things that you can use topically, um, spironolactone, um, you can use that topically. Again, probably a, a touch of that is going systemic, but when it's at 1% concentration, you're really not going to see any effects of that. Um, you know, latanoprost, which, you know, we use for, uh, a lot of women will put that on their, their eyelashes because it's a, a prostaglandin agonist and, and causes growth of those hair shafts. Uh, it does the same thing on the scalp, but with that one, I tend to see a lot of scalp irritation, um, more so than, you know, someone using a, a minoxidil or Rogaine. Okay. How about PRP? Is there any evidence for that? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's sort of a jump start. Um, I would make it kind of analogous to minoxidil where, you know, you should see results within, you know, six months. Uh, in the PRP, the results are going to depend on how healthy the person is at baseline. You know, are, are your you know, platelets healthy? Are you already, are you creating a pro-inflammatory environment by injecting that PRP into the scalp? So if someone with metabolic syndrome uses it, I think it's going to be slightly less effective than if someone who is very healthy is, is getting that PRP. It's basically just local growth factors. So, you know, you're, you're putting that in there and you're stimulating blood flow, stimulating growth. Um, and it's, it's probably the same as minoxidil where it will buy you some time, but it, it probably for most people are, it's not going to completely prevent the hair loss, but, um, yeah, there's data that shows even in people who don't respond to minoxidil, don't respond to finasteride, uh, the PRP in those people can increase hair count. And, and usually that's measured like per square centimeter or per square inch. Okay. So there definitely are some treatments out there. And I mean, a lot of the stuff that you just said, I mean, I don't think any of it was really available like 20 to 30 years ago. Or like we didn't really know about any of it. Right. Yeah. So it seems like there's some, some options out there that are, that are great. Um, okay. So our hour is just about up there, James. Is there anything that you want uh, to share before we, uh, we, we let's say goodbye to our audience? 
Yeah, no, I think that uh, we had a great conversation. Again, I appreciate you having me on. Um, thank you to everybody for listening. Hopefully you took some actionable insights or, or learned something new from the podcast. Um, but yeah, I, I think we had a, a pretty good conversation. Awesome. And James, where can people follow you online and tell them about uh, the podcast you and Kyle are doing? Yeah. So I co-host the Gillette Health Podcast alongside Dr. Kyle Gillette. Um, and then I'm on Instagram mostly uh, at James O'Hara NP. Um, and, and that's my handle for all the platforms. Awesome. And James did do a really good breakdown of a lot of the stuff that we talked about today on his Instagram page. So if you want more info, definitely go there and get it. James, thank you so much again for ha for uh, coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. <clears throat> and all the audiences and listeners, thank you so much for listening. And as always, I'll be back again soon.